this is a series trying to cover the basics of how we make steel castings so that it meets the expectations of our customers and their users. And so heat treatment is an absolutely essential part of that. We've already talked about inspection. How do I do the mechanical testing and the non-destructive testing to demonstrate that the casting meets all the requirements? We did a series on finishing. How do I machine grind, remove excess materials so that the casting meets the dimensions? Heat treating is how I make sure that that casting has the properties you need. And there are really two different kinds of properties I'm trying to get. For the ordinary carbon and alloy steels, a great majority of the market, my heat treatment is to give you the mechanical properties you expect in the component. But for the stainless steels, oftentimes what I'm trying to do with the heat treatment is make sure it gives you the corrosion performance. And so if I look at steel, this of course is the mountain from the Game of Thrones. And this is a young kid who's gone from not exercising to exercise to build his muscles. And just like strengthened people is a combination of their DNA, their parents, and their just their physical size, their nutrition and the things they do, it's also a matter of their development, how much exercise they do. So this guy is never going to be the mountain, but he can get stronger by exercising. So if we look at steel, whether you're the mountain or this kid is your chemical composition. And then whether you're uh, flabby or strong is really a matter of processing. So heat treatment is how we take a, an alloy that's not very strong and make it as strong as we can make it. And the reason we can do that is because steel is really iron and carbon, and we have a really unique opportunity right here. Most of the steels that we make are between 0.1 and 0.4 carbon content. And if I take that at room temperature, it can only tolerate, it can only hold inside a 0.008% carbon. But as I go up in temperature, and so at this temperature, at room temperature, it's got to make carbides. That carbon can't stay in solution. If I get it hot and I go up into this red area, this crystal structure, which is body center cubic, changes into face center cubic. And that's not important. Body center cubic is ferrite. Face center cubic is austenite. When I get up to this temperature, then I can dissolve over 1% carbon. So the trick in heat treatment of ordinary steels is I get it hot enough to dissolve all of the carbon, and then depending on how rapidly I cool it off, I can change where that carbon ends up, and that allows me to control the properties. And so if I take my ordinary steel, 1020 steel, it's the most common steel. This is a plain carbon steel. Sometimes when you buy ordinary steel, it's 1015. The last two numbers is how much carbon it has. This particular heat has 0.19, so it's a 1020 steel. If I anneal it, which means I heat it up in the furnace well above that red line, and then I cool it slowly so that I get the, all the carbon to be in big particles and lots of soft steel around it, lots of soft iron around it, I get the lowest properties, which makes it easy to machine and process. So some customers may want it annealed so that they can do the machining and do the heat treatment later on themselves. If I want my ordinary mix of properties and have a material that's easy to process and has good properties, I normalize it. Normalizing means I get it up to about the same temperature, 1700 degrees, and then I just cool it off in air. And so this is a picture of that. If I go up to 1600, I'm above this line, so I'm completely austenitic. I dissolve all the carbon. And then when I come down, depending on how rapidly I cool down, I get different structures, and my normal steels are between, like I said, 0.1 carbon and 0.4 carbon. If I get much above 0.4 carbon, I have a real problem with the material cracking. I get it much stronger, but the stronger I make the steel, generally the less tough it is and the less ductile it is. And so when I heat treat, basically I heat it up, and when I cross this line, I begin the transformation. When I cross this line, I finish the transformation, and then I go all the way up into this band and I hold it until all that carbide dissolves. And then you saw annealing as a furnace cool, normalizing I do with fans, and then water quenching goes really rapid. When I water quench it, 
the carbon and the iron can't rearrange themselves to make these carbides. And because of that, I lock in the carbon and I can't really dissolve it. So I get something that's really hard and really brittle. And so I have to temper it to make it softer. And so annealing, I furnace cool, normalizing, this is a fan, I air cool it. And if I look at the different heat treatments, I can anneal it, I can normalize and temper it, normalize it, and then go back up less than that uh, transformation and just make it softer. I can plain normalize it, which is just taking it up and then air cooling it, or I can quench and temper it. The quench and temper gives me the highest yield strength for any particular tensile strength. It also gives me the highest ductility for any tensile strength and the highest toughness. So when I need the highest performance, I want quenching and tempering. And quenching and tempering sometimes causes cracking and I need enough carbon in it. So those alloys tend to be more difficult to weld. And so if I need a plain vanilla, I'll get something that's normalized or normalized and tempered. If I need the optimal properties, I'll quench and temper. I can also do the same kinds of plots versus Brunel hardness. I get the same kind of behavior, not just in carbon steels. This is for cast carbon steels. I get the same thing when I have low alloy steels. Low alloy normally means less than 5% alloy. I get exactly the same kind of behavior. And one of the nice things, one of the things you can stick in your knowledge base is if I know the Brunel hardness, I have a pretty good guess of the tensile strength because the tensile strength is about half of the Brunel hardness. And so that makes it really easy just to, um, if you look at something to say, okay, it's got a 220 Brunel, it's probably got about a 110 tensile strength. And if it's got a 110 tensile strength, then it's got about an 80. So ordinarily in quenched and tempered materials, the yield strength is about 70 to 80% of the yield strength. 8620 or 8625 is one of the most common alloys we make. Most of the time with these alloy steels, we quench and temper them, but sometimes I just need it stronger than carbon steel. So 8600 oftentimes is normalized. And you can see a normalized 8620 is actually a little bit stronger than the carbon steel. 4100 is commonly normalized because the chrome moly steels are really useful in elevated temperature for things that are operating at eight or 900 degrees well above where I'd start tempering, I will use a 4100. The way to get the optimal properties, of course, is to quench and temper. You can see that here. If I look at my normal carbon range and I normalize it, I get this kind of hardness. Vickers, by the way, gives you numbers that are almost identical to Brunel hardness. So if I have a 200 Vickers, I probably have 100 tensile strength. And so if I get up to the 500 Vickers or Brunel at 20 carbon, that is hard, 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 but too hard. So I have to temper it. When I temper it, I get a choice of the temperature or the time. The longer time the softer it gets, the higher temperature the softer it gets. The challenge is I really, until I get to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, I don't get any tempering. And from about 450 degrees to 900 degrees, it embrittles the steel. So I really want to, if I want the highest strength, I'm making knives, I temper it 400 degrees. If I want it to be a normal structural component, I want it to be tempered above 900 degrees, typically from 950 up to about 1250. This shows that embrittlement that happens between 400 and 900. So 1030 is the carbon steel that water quenches. And if I water quench it, if I have a thin enough section, I can get some really good properties in 1030 steel. But once I get the heavier sections, I can't cool it fast enough to freeze that stuff in. Well, how fast is fast? That's what these diagrams are. These are heat treatment diagrams. And this says that for a one inch bar in water quenching, I still get this ferrite, I don't get the martensite that I want. In fact, I really can't make it thin enough and quench it fast enough. This is a geometry curve where I quench the end of a one inch bar and only on the surface of the one inch bar do I get martensite. Other than that, the hardness drops rapidly. So if I really want better properties, I have to add alloy content. So 8630, if I add that alloy content, instead of being at 75 KSI, I'm at 900 degrees over 150 KSI and even in the four inch section. Now, 
I only really can heat treat it thoroughly to about one inch in the 8630. And you can see that from this graph. In one inch section, I'm still getting martensite. But once I get over one inches in water or three quarters of an inch in oil, I don't get it heat treated into the center. So the reason that you use higher alloy contents is to get it to heat treat in the center. If I water quench, I cool it faster, so I lock it in more. And so this is the how fast I cool it in water. And you can see the cooling rates are over 100. If I do it in oil, it's slower. I quench in oil because when I have high carbon content and high alloy content, it'll crack if I cool it too fast and a thin section cools faster than a heavy section. So I oil quench when I have a rangy complex casting that's highly alloyed. I water quench when I have a simple casting that has a low carbon content and a low, um, and a low uh, alloy content. So the typical higher alloy where I really want the highest properties, 4100 is a less expensive. You can see that it's a chrome molly, which means it's used normalized for high temperature service. It's also a relatively inexpensive thick section heat treatable casting. But if I really want the optimal properties, all the high strength steels are really variations of 4340 with nickel, chrome, and moly. Quenched and tempered gives you really high tensile properties, and you pay for that. And you normally oil quench it so it doesn't crack. Stainless steel, I heat treat it to make it corrosion resistant. And so the higher I go in chrome, the more corrosion resistant it is. And that's because instead of having rust, that's a permeable a layer that allows me to continue to rust. In stainless steel, I form this chrome oxide paint on the surface that stops further corrosion. And so in stainless steels, I actually use composition instead of heat treatment to get these different structures. And so if I want the strongest um, stainless steel, I want the most martensite I can get. So actually, I can only add about 13% chrome and about 8% nickel, and that's where 40, 410 stainless steel or 440 steel or CA6NM or CA15 are to give you the highest properties. If I want the nice soft structure in austenite and I want to go to higher chromium contents, an 18% uh, chrome and 8% nickel, because I add a little carbon and other th manganese to get it up here, I get in this valley and that's where 304 and 316 stainless steel are. So that's why those compositions are there. If I add more chromium and less nickel, I can make a 50-50 ferrite and austenite, and that's what a duplex stainless steel is. And these are the alloys that affect that. The challenge I have with heat treating the stainless steel is that I have to get rid of all these nasty things that happen, just like uh, perlite forms or carbides form in ordinary alloy steels, even with O3 or O4 carbon, I still get carbides. I also get another phase that's chrome nitride, and then I get sigma phase, which is really brittle. And this is sigma phase. I really have to worry about what happens. I can even get embrittlement here at longer times. So in normal heat treatment or casting, I form all of these nasty things. And even though I'm low in carbon content, I have to go to much higher temperatures to dissolve the, the, um, the carbide. So I have to go to 2000 or 2100 or 2200 to dissolve the carbides. And so one of the things as you get into these more complex stainless steels, you have to look at um, uh, the heat treatment as a way of dissolving all of the carbides that cause it to have poor toughness, low Sharpie values, and poor corrosion resistance. And so for the super duplex kind of thing, a CN3MN, we found that you have to go to 2100 or 2200 to get all of that nasty stuff to dissolve so that you can get the optimum corrosion resistance and the optimum um, impact toughness. So with that, that was more than you probably wanted to know about heat treatment in 15 minutes. And I don't see any questions. So next time we have a webinar, we're going to look at shakeout and rigging because it's hard to understand gating and risering if we wait until we talk about patterns. So we're going to talk about gates and risers and why we use them and why they're on the casting when I shake it out and it looks like nothing that you wanted to order. So thanks for your time.